Hello everyone, this is Offshore Wind Power, how it works and how it's built. Well, this is part two of what originally was planned to be a three-part series, but will now probably be a five-part series, because it's just too damn interesting to leave parts out, as I'm sure you've realised by now. In this part two, we're going to be talking about wind turbine design, and I've split this into two sections, A and B. So this is the first part of wind turbine design. In part one of this series, we had an introduction to renewable energy and wind farms. So in there, we learned about why we have renewable energy, how it works, what some of the advantages and disadvantages are, and the general layout of an offshore wind farm or an onshore wind farm, and the major components therein, as well as some of the limitations. In part two, that's this part, what we're talking about today, we are going to look at the general principles of a wind turbine. We're going to look at the main parts of a wind turbine, so the major components. And that's really all we can do because a wind turbine has got thousands and thousands of parts. And we have neither the time nor, regrettably, I suspect, the inclination to go into all of them. We're going to look at the power transfer steps in a wind turbine, which are not that many, bearing in mind that kinetic energy goes in and the electricity comes out. We're going to look at direct drive versus geared drive wind turbines. Both exist. They do both still have advantages and disadvantages, which is why they are both still manufactured. We're going to look at DFIG versus back to back converter systems. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. The whole point of these presentations is that you will by the time I've finished, or at least you'll be confused enough that you can read the Wikipedia article and go, Ollie was full of crap. Part three, which will be the second type of wind turbine presentation. We're going to be basically sweeping up all the other stuff, really. So bearings, blades, control equipment, auxiliary equipment that's inside the wind turbine, as well as a summary of these two, two parts. I wasn't originally going to do the contents of part four, but I've decided I'm going to. So we're going to talk in part four about the electrical infrastructure of the wind farm. So by that, I'm talking about export cables, intra-array cables, switch gear, overall control systems, operation and maintenance ports and so on. And any auxiliary equipment that you might find on the wind farm, such as cameras, bird radar, wave radar, structural health monitoring equipment, and so on. In part five, we are going to look at the layout, construction, and operation of an offshore wind farm. So some of the considerations that goes into designing the farm in the first place the general overview of how you would go about constructing one and operating one. Now, this obviously is a huge subject in itself, so I can only give you an overview, really, um, a starting point for future studies. All right, then, well, let's push on with this exciting topic. Just a recap on part one, where we looked at the overall wind farm in general, and I've made this lovely little graphic for you uh, with my own bare hands. So over here on the right hand side, we have the wind turbine. And as we said, there's not that much in terms of energy conversion. We get wind coming in. Now, wind obviously has a degree of kinetic energy in it. So that kinetic energy in the wind, in the moving air mass is converted to kinetic energy in the moving rotor. And that kinetic energy in the moving rotor is connected to electrical energy, which then flows out of the wind turbine. In addition, there will be some heat losses because neither the electrical nor mechanical equipment inside the turbine is 100% efficient. And there will be some disturbed wind leaving the turbine quite a lot, actually, as we shall see in the next slide or the slide after, I'm not 100% sure. Now, obviously we're extracting kinetic energy from the wind, therefore the wind leaving the turbine is going to have less energy. But as we'll see, the actual solidity of the wind turbines in terms of how much resistance they subject to the overall flow of wind is perhaps not as great as you might think. That electricity, if we're looking at a offshore wind farm, flows down through the intra-array cables into the offshore substation where fitted, where it generally gets transformed to either high voltage DC or high voltage AC, which then flows down the 
export cable and that could be quite long that could be maybe 60 to 160 km or more on some modern farms through the transition joint bay which is where that offshore export cable is joined to the onshore export cable which again depending on where your on onshore substation is that might be five to ten kilometers but often is only two but let's say two to ten kilometers and then through the onshore substation where it gets transferred to the grid voltage and off to our electricity market where you and I can enjoy it for the purpose of making nice hot cups of tea which after all is the most important thing about living in a developed and sophisticated civilization isn't it okay so let us start with the principle of operation of a wind turbine as I explained in the last slide a wind turbine is generally speaking going to convert kinetic energy in the moving air into some form of electrical energy now unfortunately that first step of transferring energy is not going to be particularly efficient so just to put this into perspective overall the overall efficiency of a wind turbine is about 40 to 45 percent what that means is that the electricity that comes out of it is about 40 to 45 percent of the kinetic energy in the form of wind that goes into it now you might say that's not good you might say that's pretty good i mean a good coal-fired power station is going to struggle to be much over 40 45 so it's in the running there however there is a reason that wind turbines cannot be substantially more effective than that and that is this concept called the betts limit so Albert Betts, he was a German physicist who in 1919 calculated that no wind turbine can convert more than 59.3% of wind energy into mechanical energy in the rotor. So obviously if you start with 59.3% on an absolutely perfect rotor, then you feed it through some sort of gearbox or generator or conversion equipment, you're going to be losing more than, you know, you are going to end up with a relatively low efficiency so 40 to 45 percent does not look too bad now the reasons for this mathematical limit which cannot be broken are not too complicated to explain in the most general terms but i must admit i my aerodynamics is not particularly good if you're interested in the mathematical derivation of it there are many youtube videos that go through that and i would invite you to go and watch them and maybe come and explain it to me afterwards but the general principle is that moving mass going into the wind turbine needs somewhere to go if you had a 100% efficiency turbine, then the wind would sort of pile up behind the blades and it wouldn't be able to get out of the way to let more wind in. Now, obviously, it's a bit more complicated than that, but for our purposes, that's what we need to know. Uh, Albert Betts was not the only person who developed this law. Three or four other people did around the same time, including Frederick Lanchester, the renowned British engineer. But in keeping with the principle that no law is actually named after its inventor, it's called the Betts limit. And it's got nothing, and this is important, right? It's got nothing to do with the inefficiencies in the generator or even the blades, but in the very nature of wind turbines themselves. So yes, we can tinker around with the wind turbine. Yes, we can improve the aerodynamic efficiency of the blades and so on and so forth. But no matter what we do, we are not going to get over this 59.3% efficiency level. If you see, and you still do sometimes, advertisements claiming that some guy in a garage has got some seed funding to develop a turbine which he claims is more efficient than the bets limit, this is tosh. And it, it, it's not true, okay? I've written it's unbreakable, except for in narrow channels, which is exactly what those shrouded turbines attempt to do now interestingly in part one i mentioned that tidal turbines are in development and because tidal turbines are often placed in narrow channels those narrow channels can under certain circumstances allow those tidal turbines to exceed the bets limit but that is a geographical feature and it is not of relevance to large wind turbines now on the right here, I have this wonderful 
240p graphic that I pulled from this source here, um, which shows the efficiencies of various types of turbine. And you can see that the three bladed rotor turbine of these types here has the highest efficiency and the actual uh, efficiency of the rotor itself can peak at around 50%. Um, obviously you've got your old fashioned sort of Dutch turbines and um, American turbines, not too bad actually, 25 to 30% efficiency, which is actually not too bad if you consider that's a technology that's a thousand years old. Um, the sort of drag type, Severnius type rotors, you know, the spinning advertising sign ones, obviously they, they are very, very inefficient, but their benefit is that they're simple. It does have two bladed rotor and one bladed rotor designs here. Um, as you can see, they are slightly less efficient than the three bladed design, again, for aerodynamic reasons, which I'm not competent to speak to. But in general there can be other disadvantages to single bladed rotors in terms of the fact that the rotor has to spin so much faster and the leading edge protection system on the blade can get knackered quicker so that somewhat negates the simplicity advantage of them even though they're slightly less efficient but you might be able to accept that okay let's look at the various sort of concepts of turbines. Now, the reason I'm doing this is more to give you a historical perspective than anything else. So vertical access turbines like this Darius design used to be quite popular. And by used, I'm talking the 1970s and 1980s, and they are very uncommon today. And there's several reasons for that. Now, every so often some you know, charlatan on the internet is trying to go and get some investment on Kickstarter or something to basically rebuild one of these. But there are reasons that they're not used too much. So what are the advantages? Well, they are, they can accept wind from any direction. So there's no your system on this. OK, it's a vertical axis. So whether the wind is coming from any direction, it will spin. Now, the way they work is that these sorts of blades are wing shaped. So as the wind hits them, it uh, creates a rotational force. Some of them have quite clever mechanisms where they sort of bulge out if they're going too fast and therefore slow down. Some of them don't. The mechanical components are easily accessible at the base. Now that can be an advantage. You know, the main bearing is down there, the generator is down there. So you don't have a lot of mass high up and that can mean, that, for example, you don't need such a robust foundation system. However, they are inherently low efficiency. We saw on the previous slide around 35%. They have unfavorable loading in terms of fatigue. So if you think about it, if the wind is coming from direction X and this thing is constantly spinning in direction X, you're going to get a cycling load on the bearing as it spins, which is not ideal from the point of view of bearing life. And a lot of these turbines did fail from fatigue quite early on, not just in the bearings, but actually in the masts themselves. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them are not self-starting. Now, that's not such a disadvantage today because we have modern electronics, which can ensure that we can use the generator as a motor to get it started. But back in the 70s and 80s, that was more of a concern because such systems were either non-existent or expensive or complicated or some combination of the above. Um, sometimes they needed to have a little donkey motor attached onto the side. Sometimes they had a little Sibernius rotor attached on them in parallel, which kept it going. And sometimes they used different aerodynamic configurations to make themselves start, but that was usually at the cost of some efficiency. So then we come to the wind turbine, which we're all familiar with, which is the horizontal axis wind turbine. Now, these are basically ubiquitous today and have effectively dominated the market since the early 1980s, um, when it became practical to build them with slightly better bearing materials and more to the point when the disadvantages of the vertical axis machines became apparent after operating in California for a number of years. 
they present minimum drag so you do not typically have a lot of abstractions in the case of a wind turbine you can gather the maximum amount of wind because you can put them physically higher up which again is very difficult to do on a vertical axis turbine in principle there's no reason why you couldn't move the vertical axis turbine up onto a long pole but the fatigue loading on it would mean that the tower would have to be unreasonably wide to accommodate that and that's not such a problem with the horizontal axis turbine so we can physically put them higher up on a higher pole and therefore get more wind They've got much more favorable loading characteristics, particularly on the main bearing, because the thrust effectively is always going to be in one direction on that main bearing. Yes, there'll be a constant weight from the blades, but that's relatively insignificant in comparison to the thrust. So um, the bearing um, itself will have an easier life. Also, the mast that it's on will have an easier life because, again, as long as the wind is pushing in one direction, sure, it will oscillate in strength, but it tends to not go all the way down and start pulling the mast the other way every single rotation. So, you know, generally there'll be a, a near constant bending moment on the rotor um, tower, which is more favourable. Um, there is a disadvantage and that's that it needs additional systems for yawing so these turbines need to be turned into the wind um, that does represent a certain amount of extra complexity but honestly when you look at the benefits in terms of efficiency and structural loading the yaw systems really are not worth worrying about so mostly though wind farms are likely to be erected in windy areas that's when we build wind farms so really the inability to handle rapidly changing wind directions is less significant so yes the darius turbine can accept wind from any direction and it can accept wind from any direction very quickly because it does not need to be yawed into the wind however if you're building a wind farm in an area where the wind is changing that quickly it's not going to be a very good wind farm so you might just as well go and find a better place to build your wind farm and that is why you very rarely see vertical axis machines anymore secondly you'll have noticed that turbines are getting bigger and how the original version of this presentation i made about four or five years ago for engineering students at a local college and it stopped here with this sort of 2017 model um, at that time 2017 i was working on the design of beatrice offshore wind farm and we were using seven megawatt siemens turbines with 154 meter rotor diameter i've got here uh, airbus a380 to scale so the blades on the seven megawatt turbine are slightly shorter than the entire wingspan of the largest passenger aircraft in the world today and i have to say sadly since the um, war in ukraine which i was hoping to avoid uh, the largest aircraft in the world today now if we started in 1980 with a sort of 50 kilowatt turbine with a 15 meter rotor diameter 85 we had 100 kilowatts on the market with 20 meters by 1990 we had 500 kilowatt turbines 40 meter diameters now they were big turbines at the time and many of them are still in operation because they were quite over designed um, you had sort of 800 kilowatts 2000 you had the option of buying two megawatt turbines you actually probably could have got a three megawatt from Enercon around the time with an 80 meter diameter 2005 you were looking at sort of five megawatts 124 meter diameter 2017 these d7 siemens turbines started operation 154 meter diameter seven megawatts now the wind farms i'm working on in in taiwan we're looking at using turbines in the 14 megawatt class these have rotor diameters of around 222 meters depending on which manufacturer it is um, we haven't selected one yet but they're in that class now obviously these things are getting bigger so why there's a couple of reasons 
larger turbines are higher up and therefore they experience more constant winds and less turbulence. Most of the turbulence that you ex uh, are going to see on a wind turbine is sort of within 50 to 100 meters of the ground. So if you can shift your turbine up above that, you're going to get much more consistent wind, which leads to A, a higher electricity output and B, less wear and tear on the turbine. Doubling the rotor diameter quadruples the swept area and that's the power. I mean, that's pretty obvious. We're dealing with a diameter of a circle here. So there's not a fixed link between the blade length and the power output. It's proportional to the square. Unfortunately, counter example is the mass of the blade is proportional to the cube of its length. So we are constantly fighting uh, technology to get these blades light enough to build them bigger and bigger. Fewer, larger components means less maintenance. And to be honest, guys, this is absolutely crucial and absolutely key. And this is more than any of these other reasons. This is why wind turbines are now the cheapest form of energy in many countries, especially onshore wind farms. It's because if you can build fewer, bigger components and have fewer bigger turbines the maintenance need for them is not significantly higher than a smaller turbine but you have way fewer of them so if you have a wind farm with a hundred small turbines you've got a hundred sets of bearings a hundred sets of blades a hundred sets of towers and so on hundred control systems to monitor if you replace them with 10 super large turbines you do not have maybe one tenth of the maintenance maybe you have one fifth of the maintenance because maybe the big turbines take twice as long to maintain but there's far fewer of them so your maintenance costs go through the floor and that is particularly important but it's not just the maintenance cost because of economies of scale we can have lower installation costs because we don't have as many turbines that need to be installed sure they're bigger but in terms of the actual duration of time that it takes to install it there's not a significant difference between a small turbine and a big turbine it is more expensive to install a big turbine because we need bigger heavier equipment but it doesn't take longer and don't forget that time is very very expensive particularly when you're talking about fuel costs and skilled personnel so overall, the economies of scale of making larger and larger turbines lead to this inevitable drive to build bigger and bigger turbines. Now, we are somewhat hamstrung onshore, as I've said before. Onshore, you're looking at the sort of three to four megawatt range, um, sort of round about 120 to 140 meter diameter. And the reason for that is primarily because of how difficult it is to get those components down the little roads that you have to your windy onshore site. So obviously, if it was possible to build them bigger onshore, they would be. But in general, that is not an easy thing to do. Offshore, the sky really is the limit. We build bigger and bigger turbines and bigger and bigger installation vessels are built to create them. So it's not going to stop here at the sort of 12 to 16 megawatt class. It will go 20, 25, maybe even 30 megawatts. And from the advances that you can see here, say less than tw well, about 20 years, we have gone from sort of two megawatts to 14 megawatts. So sort of a seven fold increase in about 20 years. If you think if we do another seven fold increase in the next 20 years, we could be seeing very, very large turbines. I don't personally think that we're going to see turbines much larger than 30 megawatts, but many, many people have been wrong. When I was doing my master's degree at the University of Nottingham in 2009, my professor, Professor Seamus Garvey, who is no fool, by the way, was absolutely confident that it was going to be impossible to build turbines economically larger than three megawatts, you know, and he had staked an awful lot of research on that premise, which obviously is complete complete nonsense. So anyone, even someone as experienced and knowledgeable as that can be wrong. So who knows, maybe we see 100 megawatt turbines. I don't know. One thing I can say is that the trend, the, the driver to make them bigger and bigger is not going to go away. Side note on that, 
if you're tempted to go into your local hardware store and buy a small turbine to put on your house please don't do that um such small turbines are very unlikely to even recoup the cost of their manufacture in terms of the energy they produce whereas large turbines you're looking at a return of between six months and two years in other words the energy that these things create is sufficient to manufacture them within six months and two years of operation and that depends on the type of turbine and the site so if you read in a right ring gutter rag that wind turbines use more energy than they than they create this is absolute nonsense and these things will run for minimum 20 years up to 30 35 years so it's complete nonsense these things do generate way more energy than they need however your small turbine that you buy at B&Q will not if it says 200 watts on it you're going to be lucky to get 20 watts out of it on any given day and it's not going to run for more than a year or two without failing so just please don't you're much better off investing in a company that makes big turbines and that's going to have a much bigger effect on the world Let's look at the main components now of a wind turbine and I have here for information just some weights and dimensions of a modern sort of 12 to 15 megawatt class offshore turbine to help put this into perspective. So the nacelle is the box at the top of the wind turbine and I'll go through in the next slide about what's in there. That's the sort of main generator part of the turbine. So again, on a modern 12 to 15 megawatt class turbine, that nacelle is 22 meters long, so approximately one swimming pool long, 11 meters wide, 12 meters high, with a weight of 670 tons. So it's some unit. Blades, almost always three, um, multiple reasons for that, none of which I'm going to go into here because I'm not really qualified to explain it, but just take it from me that Every turbine uses three blades for a series of very good reasons that I don't understand. Um, they are on these types of class of turbines about 108, 110 meters long. They've got a root diameter of about 4.5 meters and they've got a weight of about 55 tons each. I believe these figures I took from the um, Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy website. So you can go and check them out. But there are other models. There's Vestas models. There's General Electric models. So I put these as sort of generic approximate figures for a turbine in this kind of class. They're all about the same. Uh, the towers, they're designed for the specific site that you're on, but they're maybe 130 meters high and maybe 600 tons, maybe more, maybe less, depends on the site. And the foundation, again, is designed for the site, so depending on whether it's onshore, whether it's offshore, whether it's a monopile, whether it's a jacket and so on, you could be looking between 1,000 and 2,500 tons for that foundation. So overall, you know, you're looking at sort of three to 4,000 tons for the total sort of system here, which is a fair amount. Uh, most of that you don't see because it's under the water or under the ground. Now, uh, that's quite a large series of bits and what I should have mentioned but didn't is that obviously the blade diameter is also designed for that specific site so any of these wind turbines will come with different sizes of blade in order that you can put them on sites with more or less wind basically so you you get your iec wind classes and you may even have different size rotors on the same farm with the same wind turbine but be careful because if you do start messing around with the blades even though the nacelle may be the same the tower and the foundation won't be so it's not simply a case of putting bigger blades on and going fuck it it'll be fine you probably won't be in the nacelle itself, the following components are always located. So the main bearings, any shafts, any pitch control gear, um, the gearbox and any lubrication systems if they're fitted. I should have said with the pitch control gear, the pumps are typically and the generators are typically fitted in there. The actual pitch control is in the hub. Uh, generator is in there, low voltage breaker, your control gear and any cooling equipment if fitted. 
then located in either the nacelle or the tower or the TP, which is a transition piece at the bottom of the tower, or spread throughout, depending on the design of wind turbine. You're going to have the main transformer and the main control computer and a high voltage switch gear. And as I said, depending on what turbine it is and depending on where it is, those things may be split a little bit. But generally, these things as a minimum are in an SL stroke hub. And these things could be in a cell tower or transition piece. Let's look briefly at the stages of conversion. I said sort of fairly flippantly that we get wind in and we get electricity out, and that is true. So that wind goes in and it turns the rotor and the rotor spins. Now that rotor is connected directly or indirectly to a generator. Now what I have here is the single line diagram from the nacelle of a Siemens wind power as it was at the time D7154 rotor system um, and I think I'm okay sharing it because this is quite an old turbine now and I don't think there's anything too secret in here. What they have is a direct drive, drive turbine with a single generator, but the generator is wound so that it is effectively two generators in parallel, system one and system two. That generator sends the electricity through a low voltage breaker into two, well, each generator sends it into one back-to-back -back AC DC converters, which I shall go on about in a bit. And then it comes out of the AC DC converters, you know, via some filters, some fuses, some other equipment. And then it connects with the other side and goes into the main transformer. Now, on the Siemens D7, all of this is in a cell. It's quite a compact, well designed turbine in that respect. The direct drive means that it, you don't waste space with the gearbox. So the transformer is actually right in a cell. And then the high voltage cable goes down a tower to the circuit breaker at the bottom of the tower or transition piece, depending on the system involved, and then out. And on the D7, that's typically 33 kV, which nowadays we're typically using 66 kilovolts for that um, so that we can use smaller cables, bigger turbines and so on. Uh, so by the time the electricity comes out of the generator it will probably have been conditioned in some way either by a back-to-back -back or a defig converter and it will have been transformed as well now any large turbine will look something similar to this an interesting thing about the siemens d7 is that this as i say splitting the generator windings into sort of two half generators each with um, its own converter means that in principle you can if one converter or one generator system fails you can continue to run the turbine at half power um small note you can't run it at half power because the overall generator is slightly less efficient without all the coils energized so heat buildup is more severe when you're running the turbine in one generator only so in actual fact from memory i think you can run it at maybe 40 percent power but it's still a lot better than nothing ideally of course one side won't fail but it's pretty inevitable that at some point over its 30 year life on some turbine something will happen and if you can limp on at say two three megawatts as opposed to zero megawatts that's still a big advantage Let's look now at the mechanical layouts that are available. Now, there's two primary mechanical layouts, geared drive and direct drive. So geared drive is pretty much exactly what you would imagine. You get your rotor and that is connected to a step up gearbox and the step up gearbox is connected to the generator. Now, obviously, the rotor is low speed, high torque and generators are typically high speed, low torque. So you need a step up gearbox. Now, I would say that about 80%, probably about 80% of turbines onshore and offshore in the world today are of this geared design. They have some kind of gearbox in there. It's difficult to get exact numbers without spending more time than I need, but it's certainly a very high proportion of them. 
So the advantage is that the step up gearbox means that you need a much smaller generator because you can have a high speed generator. And actually, you know, if you have a high speed generator with three to six to seven to 10 megawatts, it's not actually going to be physically very big. You know, it's going to be the size of a small office room or something, a box room in your house because it's got the high enough speed in it that the magnetic flux density doesn't need to be so high and therefore doesn't need to be so massive. But it is mechanically complex. Um, a step up gearbox is quite a difficult thing to make reliable. Um, it needs auxiliary equipment like lubrication equipment, cooling equipment, vibration monitoring equipment. It needs a lot of inspections done to it to make sure that it's working and you do get issues with it. So maintenance intensive and gearboxes fail. And in fact, there's been numerous examples of gearbox failures across numerous designs of wind turbine from numerous manufacturers. So it's not that there's one manufacturer who's cracked this and it works. Basically, there's metal fatigue issues. There's irregular white etching, cracking issues, there's bearing failure issues, there's vibration issues. Any of these things can lead that gearbox to fail. Not to mention the fact that it completely fills you on a cell. So typically, if you do have a geared turbine, typically, but not always, a lot of the conversion equipment and transformers are stuffed into the tower. Therefore, there is the direct drive system. Now, the direct drive system isn't new. Enercon, which is sort of a boutique German manufacturer, have been doing it since the very early 1990s. But until recently, it wasn't particularly economic to do it. Direct drive turbine, this is actually an Enercon sort of graphic here, is exactly what you say. You have your blades and rotor, which is a high speed, sorry, low speed, high torque system and that drives directly a generator now because the generator is now operating at low speed and high torque it physically needs to be very 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 much bigger for example on the siemens seven megawatt turbine the generator is about seven meters in diameter so a lot of manufacturers are now moving to this layout and it's becoming increasingly popular. It is obviously much simpler from a mechanical point of view. You know, you don't have shafts to align. You don't have gearboxes to mess about with. You simply bolt your um, generator onto your rotor and away you go. Therefore, it has lower maintenance requirements and you have much more room in the nacelle, which means you can put all your auxiliary equipment in the nacelle. And that in turn means constructing the wind turbine and assembling it on site is generally easier. But you do require a larger, heavier and very much more expensive generator because the generator is physically big. And typically, but not always, it's going to use permanent magnets. So that costs a lot of money. Um, it's difficult to install and replace single blades. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that when you're assembling a wind turbine, if it's a large wind turbine, you would typically want to load the blades on one by one. And then you can actually use the turning tools in the gearbox to rotate the entire rotor so that you can then load the second blade. Now, obviously, when you're rotating a rotor, which is not full, there's going to be very high torque on that. But that's OK because you've got a gearbox here. So when you turn the turning motor, which is on the what is usually the high speed side of the gearbox, then the rotor will have a much higher torque and it will turn slowly. And you don't need any special equipment to do that. You can't do that with a direct drive system. So if you want to do single blade insertion, which we do, then you need a single blade insertion tool, which effectively is a series of temporary hydraulic rams, which you have to sort of bolt in, rotate this a little bit, bring out, bolt in, rotate it a little bit and bring out. So it's, it's a bit of a pain in the ass, but it's not insurmountable. Uh, you need much more complex hub locking and braking systems. Again, when you have a geared system, you can have a small disc brake or shaft brake or lock on the high speed side of it. And that will easily lock the entire rotor. But here, because you don't have a torque converter, essentially, you need a braking system which can stop the entire rotor. And that's much more difficult to do. 
to the point of being impossible in many instances, or at least practically impossible, um, you need to take different strategies. So there is a disc brake on, for example, a Siemens D7 turbine, but it is not capable of bringing the rotor to a halt unless the blades are pitched out. It will just burn up, um, but that's OK. And I'll talk about that later. Incidentally, here is a small gear turbine. This is actually only a 1.3 megawatt turbine. And this is the gearbox in it. And this is a person. It's not me because I was too busy taking the photo. And then the generator is back here. So you can see that with this layout, although this is a small turbine, so it's not particularly relevant. With this layout, the gearbox does take up a lot of space inside the turbine and the whole reason that we were up there was to do endoscopic gearbox inspections and check the teeth for signs of wear which we wouldn't have had to do on a direct drive turbine so although there is no one standard and geared and direct drive turbines are still being manufactured often by the same manufacturer the trend i would say would be towards direct drive turbines however as i said direct drive turbines do have a number of disadvantages particularly permanent magnet direct drive turbines particularly in terms of the strategic materials that you need to make the permanent magnets and even the copper these days which is shot up to enormous prices events on the world stage will affect the availability of these materials so it, it is unlikely that we will see the demise of the geared turbine anytime soon particularly for the smaller onshore models where it's much easier to get at them and maintain them Okay, let's look at the types of generator that you might find inside a wind turbine now there's predominantly two types there's the doubly fed and there is the permanent magnet now older turbines may have slightly different types of generator but in the world today these are the two types so first look at the doubly fed induction generator so it's quite common again it's difficult to quantify don't forget that most turbines in existence today are quite old and most turbines in existence today are quite small so although in my day-to-day -day life I deal with projects which use turbines of 7 to 14 megawatts the majority of turbines today are onshore turbines and they're maybe in the 1 to 2 megawatt class and they're maybe 20 years old and on those turbines doubly fed was a thing I'll explain what it is in a bit but generally speaking it's a, a wound generator with coils on the rotor and the stator so therefore it uses low cost materials because it doesn't have any permanent magnets in it although copper is expensive it's generally not as expensive as permanent magnets it has very low maintenance you can make these things brushless if you want um, but sometimes they have brushes often they're brushless so there's very little maintenance they're very easy to make and they're a well understood technology they can be synchronous or asynchronous depending on the exact design of it but they are less widely used on direct drive machines due to scaling and magnetic flux density requirements and that to be honest is one of the reasons why permanent magnet generators were deployed for wind turbines the original Enercon machines from the early 1990s did use doubly fed generators as far as I know they do have a slightly lower efficiency than the permanent magnet machine, but it's still very good. And by very good, I mean greater than 90%. So the efficiency argument, mm, potato, potato. And second type, permanent magnet. Here is a big direct drive permanent magnet generator in the um, Enercon factory. Now, actually, as far as I can tell, what you're seeing there is the copper windings rather than the permanent magnet side of it, but uh, you get the general idea. They are increasingly common and um, they have excellent efficiency, so 95 plus percent. Um, they are ideal for direct drive layouts. 
perhaps that's the wrong ter terminology. They're pretty much the only option for direct drive layouts now. Now that turbines have to be economically, um, now that turbines have to be economically viable, there's not a lot of other options there. They're synchronous only, meaning you cannot use some sort of doubly fed electrical generator system to operate them. You need to have a back to back inverter. Uh, and they use expensive strategic materials, as I've said. And the manufacturing process is difficult due to the high strength of the magnets. Although in practice, what is done is a very clever machine is used, which loads demagnetized magnets into the rotor and then hits them with a certain electrical magic, which magnetizes the magnet. I actually don't understand the physics of it, but I've seen it done and it's quite impressive. Notwithstanding that, once the magnet is magnetized, you obviously have to be very, very careful what you do with that rotor because these are very powerful magnets. And once something sticks to it, it's very difficult to unstick it. So as I say, permanent magnet machines, increasingly common, but not market dominating. Whatever form of generator we get, uh, we need to connect the electricity that comes out of it to the grid. Now, with the exception of the very, very first wind turbines in the 1970s and early 1980s, every wind turbine today is a variable speed turbine. That means that the rotor speed changes depending on the wind speed, direction, turbulence and so on. What that means is it will give a variable frequency output and we need an output that matches a grid frequency, which is 50 hertz in civilized countries and 60 in the colonies. So in order to do that, we need to do some rectification and some inverting. Now, this is just a reminder of what rectification and inverting is. So rectifying is when I take an AC input and I put it through a diode bank and I get a DC output, albeit with some degree of ripple. Now a three phase rectifier takes a three phase input, which is three phases of sinusoidally oscillating electricity 120 degrees apart. And it puts them through a bank of six rectifying units. Now I have drawn six diodes here, but in practice, each of those diode banks may be 12 diodes because the current is high enough and you know, you can do that. And then you will get a sort of ripply DC output. Now you can do various smoothing of that using inductors and capacitors if you want an absolutely smooth waveform. Now, it's worth pointing out that I've shown you a passive rectifier there, but there are active rectifiers where instead of a passive diode, you use an active thyristor or um, IGBT, which does have some advantages. So you can use active rectifiers. Advantages of an active rectifier is that you can pulse width modulate the output directly. Um, most commonly active nowadays because the efficiency is slightly higher when we turn on that active component we do not experience such losses through it um, and it does require filtering and smoothing circuits an inverter is the opposite of a rectifier it takes dc and it inverts it typically to three phase ac um, it's an active machine, you can't invert passively, and a solid state machines either with IGBTs or thyristors on older models. If you don't know what they are, I believe I have talked about them before in my electric locomotive presentation. Now, a lot of this technology that wind turbines use was developed for electric locomotives, so a lot of it's the same. Now, generally speaking, you'll use IGBTs in a bank, you'll actively switch them. And if you imagine that you would get a sort of square wave output per uh, IGBT bank, what you then do is you pulse width modulate that square wave output. So it gives you a sort of pseudo sinusoidal output. And with enough filtering and smoothing, you can get a true sinusoidal output from that. So this is a fairly established technology. Now, all wind turbines, whether they're back-to-back -back or defig, will have some degree of 
inversion and some degree of rectification. But let's look at why. The DFIG system is what you see here, and it stands for doubly fed induction generator. Okay, so doubly fed induction generator. Now, what that means is that you have a generator with wound coils on the rotor and the stator. Now, typically the stator will be connected to the grid and the rotor will not be connected to the grid. Now, in order to get an output from the stator, you need to rotate the rotor, but also energize it so that there is a magnetic field in it which cuts through the stator. Now, before I go on, I should say that the advantages of DFIGs is that they are relatively low cost and they need a small converter. Why? Remember when I said that the rotation speed into the wind turbine is variable? Okay, so it can be low or it can be high. What that would mean is that the frequency of the output is also all over the place and we can't have that. Now, if we put a constant signal into the rotor, then we would get a varying frequency output because the rotor speed is changing. But we want a fixed output. Therefore, what if I put a varying frequency input into the rotor? And that varying frequency input is matched exactly to the rotor speed. Well then, I will get a fixed frequency output. That's clever, I hear you say. How on earth do you do that? Well, what you do is you connect the stator directly to the grid, because we now know that the stator is going to have a nice constant frequency. We take some of the output of the DFIG and we feed it into a small grid side converter system. So this is a small back to back rectifier inverter system. And we adjust the output of that inverter. In effect, we adjust the frequency of that inverter depending on the speed of the wind turbine. So if the wind turbine is running fast, we put a low frequency in here. And if the wind farm is running slow, we put a high frequency in there. And what that means is that it affects the output frequency and we make the output frequency constant. Now, the advantage of this is that the converter system that we have is only handling a very small amount, say 10% of the total current flow in the entire circuit. So we need a much smaller and much cheaper converter as against a back-to-back -back type, which takes the entire output of the generator, rectifies it, inverts it, and matches it with a grid. So you get a small, low-cost inverter. And they have pretty good efficiency, you know, and some would say that the overall efficiency of um, a doubly fed generator with a converter is as good or better than that of a permanent magnet generator with a back-to-back -back converter. And that's why both of these systems are still in use. But they can only work on asynchronous generators, so they don't work on permanent magnet generators because what you are adjusting here is the rotor field frequency. Whereas, of course, on a permanent magnet generator, the rotor field is created by permanent magnets, so you can't adjust it. So these will only work on asynchronous generators, which means that in general, you will only see these on machines with gearboxes. But if you had a choice of two machines, both with gearboxes, one with a permanent magnet generator and one with a doubly fed electrical generator or induction generator rather, then you would not see that much difference in terms of efficiency and you would probably find that the defig one would be slightly lower cost. It can struggle with some grid codes. So what are grid codes? That's a very good question that electrical engineers like to talk about for weeks on end. 
essentially if you're connecting your wind turbine to a national grid it has to comply with a load of situations to do with short circuit frequency stability reactive power and so on generally speaking countries with small grids have stricter grid codes than countries with large grids so it's relatively easy to connect any old crap in say the uk but it's more difficult in say the republic of ireland so the grid code compliance of these may be more difficult and they may need additional filters shunt reactors and so on which may push the cost up beyond just having a back-to-back -back inverter in the first place may it's very much depends on the grid code of that particular place you want to connect to and that particular turbine but that's what a bfig is second type is called the back-to-back -back inverter and it's probably the way that you would probably assume that this would be done if you weren't an electrical engineer now this is increasingly common and one of the reasons they are increasingly common is because the low cost of heavy duty insulated gate bipolar transistors which are now much cheaper than they were so it's pretty straightforward you have your variable speed input at the rotor you take your permanent magnet generator although you could also use um, a doubly fed generator if you want it and just feed it with a constant frequency but generally speaking it's going to be a permanent magnet generator you rectify everything using your full bridge three-phase rectifier that gives you a DC output then you invert everything into your AC so call it 50 Hertz because we're in a civilized country and you connect that to the grid so you need a large converter because you are rectifying and inverting the entire output of the generator rather than just a small portion of it so they have excellent grid code compliance because of the flexibility software and so on that's in these things so you can pretty much connect these to anything they work on synchronous generators so including permanent magnet in practice they are usually paired with permanent magnet ones so they can work with asynchronous or synchronous but the point is that they will work with synchronous permanent magnet generators they are generally more expensive because as I say you need to rectify and invert the entire current flow instead of just a small portion of it now that cost difference is maybe not as significant as it was because the cost of this conversion equipment is plummeting partly due to how much of it we're using and partly due to IGBTs being widely adopted for everything and they are generally slightly less efficient than a defig so the actual converter stage may well be slightly less efficient than a defig but because the generator if it's a permanent magnet is slightly more efficient and because if you don't have a gearbox it's slightly more efficient again the overall comparison is very very similar so for that reason different manufacturers will still use different systems and both still sell at the moment there isn't a clear winner it seems credible to me that the back-to-back -back permanent magnet direct drive system will eventually prevail but as i said that very much depends on a lot of factors well beyond engineering control particularly megalomaniacal dictators in countries where rice is the staple diet okay I think that's probably enough for one day let's learn what we have done so wind turbines convert kinetic energy from the wind into electrical energy that we use for watching this video their overall efficiency is sort of 40 45 percent so not too bad and the trend is towards fewer larger machines direct drive and geared machines exist and various electronic systems are used even though all turbines look roughly similar so if we're not familiar with turbines they all look pretty much the same but they may have fairly fundamental architectural differences internally and they all have different advantages and disadvantages later in part three we will cover the blade bearings and auxiliary equipment of the wind turbine and there are quite a few issues with those components particularly in their manufacture and maintenance and then further on we'll look at the wind farm overall electrical system and we'll look at the construction operation and maintenance of the wind farm 
As ever, I'd like to thank you very much for paying attention throughout this presentation. And if you have any comments, please add them in the box below. Other than that, I'll see you next time.